So I'm here with Dr. Ned Sharpless, the director of the National Cancer Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, so you, so you were sworn in October seventeenth. Seventeenth, yes. Um, and you had mentioned that you were really excited to take on this role to lead the NCI at this time. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you're so excited about it? Sure. During the interview process, uh, the executives at Health and Human Services asked me why, why now? Why, why would you want to be NCI director? And I sort of mentioned that I, I thought this was, uh, you know, we're going to remember cancer researchers today the way we talk about like Pasteur and Coke and antibiotics. I mean, it's, it's just that kind of time going on for cancer research. There's tremendous exciting developments every day. Um, you know, what, what kind of ha happened in, our, on, in the war on cancer, if you will, is that uh, we started it before we really knew much about the, uh, uh, the foe. You know, we, we had a, the ability to treat some cancers that we would kind of discovered empirically, but the, um, the, the mechanism whereby we would, uh, you know, defeat cancer, we didn't really understand because of our lack of the basic biology, biological understanding of cancer. And so over the last decades, we've really filled in that information. And now we have a pretty good understanding, in many cases, of the molecular biology of what drives cancer. And that makes it easier to, 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 to target cancer, to, to develop therapies that are effective. And so now, um, and, and in fact, one of the most important discoveries of that effort is a realization that there's not one or two cancers, there's like a thousand or 10,000 different kinds of cancer. And each one of those requires a specific therapy. But we've now, so now started to make progress on many, many fronts. We have immunotherapy and small molecule inhibitors and cellular immunotherapy and just a variety of different ways to treat cancers at different stages and states, and so it's a really exciting time in cancer research. Mm -hmm. But some of these advances, as you know, um, the average cancer patient, I believe, now already spends about more than $50,000 um, in new therapies, and that's without some of these CAR T and immunotherapy things that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point. Um, is that a concern in terms of moving these advances along and accessing, having patients be able to access them? number of things to say about that. Uh, first off, it, it is tr correct that the care, the costs of care for patients, not just the drugs, oh. but the hospitals, the radiation oncology, the pathologists, you know, the whole shooting match, that's gotten very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, patients uh, are experiencing more and more of the costs of their care directly. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only are uh, the things more expensive for the insurance company, they're more expensive mm -hmm. for the patients. Mm -hmm. And this leads to this issue of financial toxicity. And, mm -hmm. We have data that this is a significant barrier to care, that people who are worried about how they're going to pay for their care, or how they're going to experience this financial toxicity, are less likely to seek certain forms of care. So this is a very important issue for the National Cancer Institute about how to ensure access to uh, both new, cutting-edge, very expensive therapies like CAR T cells, but also established, more traditional therapies like surgery and radiation oncology, which work quite well, but can be quite expensive in their own right. So the entire cost of care is an issue of which drugs are an important component. Another thing to say about uh, these eye-popping numbers uh, for CAR T cells and some of the new drugs in terms of their cost is that while those uh, therapies are very expensive today, I am certain their costs will come down. Mm -hmm. As patents expire, as technology manufacturing improves, as we get better uh, at using these sorts of agents and their toxicity goes down, then uh, what costs uh, a lot today will cost less in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I like to make the point that at one time, Drugs like uh, you know the statins that everybody takes now, those were considered uh, so expensive and were going to break uh, our ability to pay for, for care. But now those drugs are available on the $4 list at Walmart. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, eventually uh, these drugs will become less expensive. And the good news is that uh, when that happens, we'll have less expensive therapies that are very, very effective that are widely available to everyone. Although this period in initially when they're approved is a complicated and, and trying time. So what is NIH's, NCI's role, if any, in, in addressing this cost issue? Um, yeah, so we don't set drug prices. That is a, a complicated topic that uh, has a lot of market forces and regulatory issues, and, and the NCI largely mm -hmm. stays out of the whole debate, other than we play an important role in funding the research that leads to new therapies and hopefully less, expens le le less, less expensive, more effective therapies. So we, mm -hmm. we believe that it, we can sometimes find a, a new way to do something that's less expensive and less toxic than the old way of doing it. Uh, and similarly, um, we, we do fund a quite a bit of research about the impact of uh, high costs of care on patients or you know, the impact of certain policies related to cancer care on patients. And so we really want to know, um, you know if you did change how we 
price drugs or how we approve drugs, you know, what would that mean for the burden of cancer in the United States? So, so we have an important research mission in informing this debate. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sharpless. I appreciate your time. And sure, my pleasure. Right, thank thanks. you for having me. Thank you.